I need a little drink after that set. That was good. That let, that grave the gardens. There's nothing better than God. He's brought us to this place. My name is Clyde McKinney, one of the evangelists here at Severn Christian Church. And uh, welcome today, Severn. Uh, you made it through the cold. It was 17 when I woke up this morning. And uh, if you want to, you can snuggle a little bit more this morning. We're having problems with the heat again. I think you've already known that. But I think the worshiping God sort of warmed us up a little bit, didn't it? Uh, if you're new with us, you're visiting today, good to have you be a part of our family here. Um, good to see you. And even though it's hard for me to see you real clear, it's good to see you. I'm glad you're here. Uh, in the, in the uh, chairs there, there's some uh, visitor's cards. Uh, if you're new, fill that out. Uh, take it out to our Welcome Center, and there uh, you will find a, a gift uh, from us and also some uh, words in, uh, about us, and so you get to know us, we get to know you a little bit uh, as well. Uh, the title of the sermon this morning is A Closer Walk with God, and uh, after singing that last song, uh, There's Nothing Better Than You, it just, I don't know about you, but it pulls me close to God, and He desires that, you know, that walk with us. Uh, last week I heard uh, just a little bit, I was walking in the hallway coming back after coming off the stage, and I heard... Um, Kyle say something about a mullet, you know, about his hair has been growing up since he's been sick and everything. And I thought, you know, I, maybe I'll challenge him on that too and I'll grow me a mullet, you know. Then I thought, you know what, I think with a mullet you need bangs. Mine are long gone. <laughs> so uh, Judy, a couple weeks ago, uh, you can blame this on her, but uh, the father's home and he's reading his Bible uh, from Revelation chapter 8. And uh, his wife comes in, he says, Hunt, according to Revelation chapter 8, there's no women in heaven. No females there. She says, what? He says, go look it up. And so his daughter comes home, and she tells the daughter, hey, you know, your father said there's, there's no women in heaven. Look at Revelation chapter 8. And so they looked it up. It says, behold, the lamb poured out the seventh bowl, and for a half an hour there was silence in heaven. <laughs> <laughs> so we have a tendency to stereotype each other, don't we, in our society? And uh, Gary Smalley always said, that our women have the relationship manual within them. We need to pay attention to them. Our ladies were designed to connect through conversation. That's why they heard into the bathroom. And us dudes, we just we make sure there's nobody in there first before we go in. But God created us to be connected on a personal level. And he wants that with us as well. And so we can be close to God. We know how to do that. James tells us, draw near to God. He draws near to you. That's a promise for him. He wants to be near. He's a relational God. And he wants us to relate to him. And he wants us to draw near to him. But we can also be distant, can't we? And like our marriage relationships, and our, even with our children, and even with our friends, we can become distant because we're not connected through conversation. But also it's our independent desire for God to love him, desire him, to need him will cause us to come closer to him and to communicate with him. Sometimes it's our ability to communicate or not being able to communicate. Also our value of what relationship is. I was really blessed growing up. My parents were young and they related to us. We had heart-to-heart -heart relationships. We had bonding experiences growing up together. And I think we did grow up together. And... Um, now, when I say heart-to-heart, -heart, I want to tell you what I mean, because I'm probably going to say it a few times. And I ask couples when they come in uh, to my office, you know, have you had a heart-to-heart -heart lately? And I get a blank look, <laughs> and they know they haven't. And uh, have you ever had a heart-to-heart? -heart? Do, do you know what that means? And uh, it's sharing experiences from our heart. It's the things sometimes that are hidden there. It has to be safe for us to, to be able to get personal and talk about things. That's a heart-to-heart. -heart. It's also recognizing uh, that we need reconciliation. We've disappointed each other. It's been hurt and pain. And so a heart-to-heart -heart would be negotiating through that and healing that. It is sharing feelings and dreams that we had. And so my first heart-to-heart, I remember as a kid, was about 10, 11 years old. And, uh, you know, that's a big moment when you find out that life isn't fair. And so my mom had to comfort me because my older brother, Jimmy, had severe asthma growing up. I had to do all the outside work. I had to mow, had to trim, and Back then, my father wanted the sidewalk trimmed, and all we had was a hatchet. You had the hatchet, you had to dig that up. Don't you feel sorry for me? I was 10 years old. I had to do all the work. So one day, I come running through the house. Nobody loves me. 
Nobody loves me. What's that old saying? Nobody loves me. Everybody hates me. I think I'll go eat stones or something. Maybe that wasn't it. But no, I felt no love. I felt taken advantage of. And I run upstairs. I was crying. Here comes my mom. She took the time to settle me down, reassure me of her love for me, and so I can move on with life being so unfair. As teenagers, uh, my friends used to like to come over to my house because we would sit at our kitchen table and my mom would have conversation with us. She would spend that time to say, my mother never does this. Your mother's great. But also, she was young and very attractive. I think they were there for that too. <laughs> Going forward, 1982, I was a lost soul. My mom was lost. My family was basically lost. We went to church just a few times. But in 1982, my mom said, hey, would you go to church with me? I said, yeah, if you go to church with me, because I had discovered Joppatown Christian Church. In 1982, we were both baptized in that year. And so we shared that bond. And plus, the, it was a 40-minute ride from Dundalk to Joppatown. And so that 40 minutes just gave us time to talk and connect our hearts. Also, we went back to school together. I had dropped out of school. She had to leave school at a very young age. And man, I always remember that phone call. Mom calls me up. And she says, do you want to go back to school? It's like, whoa. My heart just exploded because it had bothered me for many, many years that I didn't have my high school diploma. I'll tell you, the day that thing came in the mail, we celebrated, didn't we? It was a special day. And so um, in that drive back and forth to Joppa Town I was telling you about, and uh, we had one of those bonding moments. Uh, we would take her Dodge Dart, and uh, remember the old darts? They had a 318 in them, and they're supposed to be grandma cars, but man, they could fly. And uh, she had a nice little green with a, black, with a nice vinyl roof and everything, and we would stop for gas, and uh, I'd get out and fill it up for mom, and uh, it was at Amico, and uh, it was a couple weeks, and something had changed, but I hadn't really noticed. Well, what they did is they put a diesel pump in. I filled that little dart all the way to the top, topped it off with diesel. And I said, oh, no, will we make it home? And we were about a mile away. So we're driving down Dundalk Avenue, and all of a sudden, this blue and gray smoke just fills. The, you couldn't see anything. And I made, made it home and parked the car. Well, she never let me fill up the car again. <laughs> but that was a moment. It was heart to heart. It was an experience. So we were really blessed. Four boys, right? Grandmother lives right next door. Now, I don't know how blessed she was, but she was there. And uh, she would make breakfast, you know, on Saturday mornings. And I always said I like to have a nickel for every bowl of pancakes she mixed up for us kids. And so it was intimate grandma in the, in the sense of being there for us right next door. And uh, one day she says to me, go get the box of pictures. And I said, oh, no, I know what this meant. I'm going to be here for a couple hours. But as we got the pictures out and as we looked through of them, all black and white, back in the 40s, wartime pictures, men in the theater, uh, relatives that we had lost in the war. And we just sat there for hours, and she explained all those pictures and shared that history with me. Now, uh, Grandma wasn't touchy-feely and huggy like our, like our Chuck Flitter here. Uh, but, 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 you know, and so, and I wondered about that. And later on, she told me. And uh, she, Grandma... Uh, was shipped from house to house and family to family through her, all her young, formative years. She said she always had her suitcase packed and it was under the bed because she didn't know where she was going next. And so I knew that she had a broken childhood, and I knew she suffered difficult things and pain and anguish, and, uh, and, it, and it, it, was, it was a tough life, you know, for her. And so uh, that's why I knew she, uh, that I knew I needed to go to her when I had that first teenage heartbreak. You remember that, your first teenage heartbreak? And uh, I had one of those. My heart was broken. I was sitting on her front steps, and Grandma comes out, and she didn't hug me physically, but she hugged me with her words. And I figured out, because of the pain she suffered, she could take your pain, and she comforted me during that time. You know, my first encounter with God was just very young, six years old. And it um, wasn't church, it was at home. Uh, I had contracted rheumatic fever, and it's a heart murmur that you get. And uh, all the joints in your body, your fingers, your elbows, your knees, your hips, they ache. 
And uh, I'm thankful it wasn't all one day, because one day the elbows, and one day the hips, and one day the knees, and then your muscles would contract and be inflamed. And it was miserable for my mom, too. I mean, she, was, she had to hear me cry, like, every day. They moved my bedroom downstairs, and that's where I stayed. And, uh, and so me and mother and I had a special bond during those years. Now, we look back, and I ask, she don't remember them. And I, that's, I think, how you survive, you know. I said, how did you do it, Mom? I don't know. I just got up every day and did it, you know. But anyway, during that time, I, I got one of those plaques. Remember, now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep me for to die before I wake. I pray the Lord my soul to take. Now, they changed that because they don't want the kids to get upset now. They say, angels watching over me. But when I said the prayer, you know, I said, whoa, I, I, I could die before I wake. So I asked God, I said, you know, God, you know, don't let me die because I still want to ride my little red bike that I got the Christmas before. And, uh, you know, cause you, you have about a few, you've got to stay in for a year. I'd take penicillin, couldn't go out or anything like that. And, um, and so I gave my mother another bonding moment. Finally, when I could ride my bike, I got out with my brother and his friend Roy, and we took off, and there's sidewalks all over. There was a school real close to our house, and, and we rode around, excuse me, at sidewalk. And I'm pedaling away so happy and finally outside on my bike riding around, and my wheel hits a ditch. And the bike flips. One handlebar hit me here over top of the eye, and blood's running down my face. Then before I hit the ground, the other handlebar came over and bruised my eye underneath. It was bad. But worse than that, I look over, and this thumb was sitting on my arm. It looked like an alien hand. My brother and his friend took off. I said, well, could one stay and one go get help? No, they both. I'm just crying by myself, bottom of this big hill, the woods up there, school's right here. And then all of a sudden I hear, uh, it happened to be my uncle was running in the woods with a friend. And then he jumped the fence, came down, threw me on his back, and I'm, and I'm on his back bouncing. There's my thumb sitting there like that. It was a scary moment. And so he had to bring in the house and get my mother, <laughs> notify her. And we went to the hospital. And I'll, I'll never forget that moment because that doctor grabbed my thumb and he went up and out. And this hand socked him in the cheek. So I believe those early years, those heart-to-hearts, those moments, prepared me for what God designed us to be, close to him, personal worship. See, he created us like himself, relational, and he wants that bond with us. And who better could describe the heart-to-heart than King David? He's the one that writes Psalm 39. In a minute, we're going to turn there, but I want to share some other things first. He was a man after God's own heart. Doesn't that say something? You know, I think we'd like to hear that, wouldn't we? I wish she was after my heart like I'm after her heart. And all through the Old Testament, David's life was laid open bare for us to see through the, through the Bible. We see his victories and we see his failures. And most notably, when he had to write seven or ten penitential psalms, psalms of repentance, to restore his heart back to God's heart, because he had committed adultery with Bathsheba, and they had an illegitimate child, and he had her, her husband, Uriah, killed. So Dave, David had a lot to reconcile, didn't he? This man who was after God's heart. We can slip, can't we? God's calling us back. But here's what he said in Psalm 32, 5 as he would reconcile his relationship with God. He confessed these words. I acknowledge my sin to God, he said, and my iniquities I didn't hide. I said I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. And notice, you forgave the guilt of my sin. Through it all, David knew that he needed God to reform his sick, lustful heart. And in Psalm 51.10, he says this. He cries out after he's asking for cleansing from God in many ways. He said, create in me clean, clean heart. He knew how dirty it was and how damaged his heart was. So he cries out for a clean heart and a steadfast spirit within himself. So he knew in order to have that relationship with God, his heart needed to be adjusted. And so he cries out for God to give it to him. Because you know what? We can't clean our own heart, can we? We have to surrender it to God. And he does the cleaning. He forgives. 
If there's anyone who knew God, both theologically, because of the work of the Holy Spirit, and personally, because of the relationship, it was King David. So we want to listen to his advice this morning. So he introduces the incomprehensible attributes of God. But I want you to see in this passage not so much that theological part of God, which happens to be his omniscience we're going to look at today, but how he uses that power to pull us to a closer walk. This is that God is omniscient. That means he is all-knowing. He's all-wise. Every decision he makes is wise. He has infinite awareness, understands, and has insight into all things. So he has complete knowledge. And our theologians here in the church can explain that better than me, but I don't want to focus on that. I want to focus on how he uses that power today. And so first we see in God's infinite knowledge, he chose to be intimate with us, with you. And so say in your own heart as we read this passage, once I get to it, make it personal. He's saying it to you. I've searched you and know you. So God created us for a closer walk. That's what he desires. That's how he is. He's that type of God. But in our world today, we've substituted personal pleasure in self for relationship. The relationship God designed us to have, like marriage, the two become one flesh. All types of entertainment, all types of technology has taken the place of human connection. We've lowered the standard of relationship way down here. And all these other things interest us. And we have lost connection with each other. It's another reason why the divorce rate is so high and people can't understand each other. Because we haven't invested in relationship, the kind that God wants us to have. You know, our cell phones have interrupted relationship. You go to restaurants, that's when couples talk, right? No, phones, phones are going... Oh, but it's a connection, isn't it? Isn't it communication? Yeah, maybe. A little bit. Yeah, you stay in touch. But it steals our time. It steals our personal conversation. It connects us. From the very beginning of time, time, physical, earth, time, people, time, all through the Bible, God demonstrates his desire for a closer walk with each one of us. And here's some examples. In in, um, Genesis chapter 3, verse 8, we find the passage before Adam and Eve sin and take the fruit, they're completely innocent. And it said God would come in the cool of the day to walk with them, conversate with them. Now, I don't know uh, what condition God came in. I don't know what body he came in, if he even came in the body. But there was conversation, relationship, personal with Adam and Eve, our first parents. Looking forward to Exodus chapter 29, verse 45. God brings Israel 400 years of bondage in in, in slavery in Egypt. He brings them out and he reassures them of the closeness that he wants to have with them. And here's what he said. I will dwell among the sons of Israel. I will be their God. And so God was there by a pillar of smoke by day and a pillar of fire by night. He wasn't aloof. He could have been anywhere, and he is everywhere. But he chooses in that awareness to be with his people, to walk among them. And then we find in Leviticus chapter 26, verse 11 and 12. He says, moreover, I will make my dwelling among you, and my soul will not reject you. See, God wants a soul relationship. He said, I'm going to connect my soul, even if you break my heart. And they did over and over again through history. I will walk among you, and you shall be my people. He's possessing us. He wants to be close to us. You see, God made his presence known. He says, I'll multiply your children, your childbearing. I'll multiply your food. I'll make sure you have everything you need. He says, I'll chase your enemies. And if you read in that same passage earlier, here's what he said. He says, if you have five Israelite soldiers and they start running, they'll chase away a hundred of the enemy. He says, then if you have a hundred soldiers, you'll chase tens of thousands of the enemy away. You see, God wanted them to know that he was among them. And they knew it in their hearts, just like you do, and God blesses you, answers your prayer. Now, by the time we get down to Deuteronomy chapter 6, I want to read verse 7 and 9. 
the first generation fell in the desert. They didn't want to be close to God. They wanted to be close to Egypt. They wanted to be close to the world and the world's goods. And they couldn't make it. But the second generation was ready to go in, so God decides to give the law, the moral law, the second time. But this time, he gives them the law on a personal relationship level. He said, I want to write it on your heart. I want to do it. I want you to, to share my word, the commandments I give to you, in a relational setting. And notice what he says. Verse 7. You shall teach them the law diligently, diligently to your sons and daughters. You shall talk to them when you sit down in your house, when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise up. In verse 9, he tells us, write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. Now, they hadn't lived in a house yet. They hadn't gone into Jericho yet. They're ready to go in, and God gives the law the second time, but he does it through relationship. He says, because I want you to put it on the doorpost of your house. Because, see, they were intense. And God's going to move all the enemies out, and they're going to have their gardens and their grapevines, their vineyards, and their houses already sitting there. And he says, I want you to do something in them. I want you to talk to each other. I want you to share my moral law. This reminds me, we were back in Bible college, Judy and I. Uh, we weren't dating yet, and uh, we'd have chapel twice a week at the college. And then afterwards, we'd go to the cafeteria uh, and eat our lunch, and we would have the guest speaker come up. We'd get to talk to him intimately and share with him and everything. But um, Judy and I started talking about the sermon and spiritual things. And three hours later, <laughs> we stopped. Now, she told me later, she went home and told her mom, I could marry that guy. And then she said she wasn't going to let my name slip, but it did. And she made Esther swear she wouldn't say a thing. But you see, God's word was the subject. And it bound us spiritually. And I tell her, it made me feel close to you too. God is still our favorite subject. So about a month ago or a couple of months ago, uh, when uh, Randy fell ill, and we went over to Randy and Debbie's house, and uh, we couldn't get all the professionals she needed to watch him overnight. He was up all night. And she needed some sleep. And so some of us volunteered, and Chuck and I went together. And, uh, and we had walked Randy. He would maybe sit down for 10 or 15 minutes or so, and we'd walk him around the living room and around the table in the kitchen and come back and uh, sit him on the couch and, and uh, sit, you know, he had a tough time sitting down and sitting down. And uh, we talk a little bit, and, uh, and then he'd get up. I want to go again, you know. So all night, we just walked him around the house. But on the walls of Debbie and Randy's house was scripture. It was on this wall and on that mantle. It was in the bathroom. It was over here by the side chair. The word of God was there. And I'll tell you, walking in, I wasn't sure what we were going to do. And you just don't know in those situations. He needed us to help him in every sense of the way. One of my favorites was actually in the bathroom. <laughs> God's moral law. God's Holy Spirit. The attributes of the Holy Spirit are there. But I'll tell you, that reassured us as we walked him around of God's presence. And we made it through the night, didn't we? You've made it through some difficult times. And it was a reminder of God's word being there. In Jeremiah 31, 33, a very famous verse in the Bible, in the Old Testament, here's why it's famous. Because at the time, Babylon, the enemies of Israel, were sitting right at the gate. You see, Israel had abused God's grace. Through the times of Solomon, the times of David, they called it the golden years. They built one of the wonders of the world, the temple of God. Now, they weeped over this. Solomon weeped even though it was a magnificent edifice with gold and, and material from all around the world. Uh, they wept. But sooner or later, what happened is the people of Israel fall away. And they said it, they started paneling their own houses and they neglected the temple. And so now the enemies were at the gate. And during that time, the weeping prophet, the prophet whose soul was in darkness because of the trauma that was coming, they didn't want to listen to him. Said, your enemies are coming. It's all going to go away. They're going to take it away. And sure enough, they took away the people and destroyed the temple and all its beauty and all its glory. And that temple worship was over for Israel. 
But during that time, here's what God said. I will make an everlasting covenant with mankind. And I personally will write it on their hearts. I'll put it within them. And I will walk with them and they shall be my people. So God's intention, personal one-on-one relationship. And that was thousands of years before the fulfillment came through the Lord Jesus. Because how close did God want to get? It said that Jesus was Emmanuel, God with us. So he comes in human form. And for 33 years, Jesus walked among us human beings. And it was so long ago, we read it from the Bible, and it's hard for us to kind of hold on to that, isn't it? Or try to imagine Jesus right here. But he did something better. He said, I go away because the comfort will come. And each believing Christian who's been baptized into Christ has the indwelling now presence of, God, of the Godhead, the Holy Spirit. So he's with us always, isn't he? For all time. But that couldn't have happened unless Jesus was willing to go to the cross, redeem us back to God for that personal relationship. And so he died for our, our sins that we may have this relationship with God. So we're going to see here in Psalm 39 that God uses infinite power for that very thing, for a one-on-one relationship with us all. So look at it with me. Psalm 139, 1 through 6. Get your phones up or your tablets and your Bibles out and listen to these words. Now, what I want us to see here is that God uses his power for the purpose of relationship. Here's what David says. O oh Lord, you have searched me and known me. How does he do that? You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You understand my thoughts from afar. You scrutinize my path, my lying down. You're intimately acquainted with all my ways. Even before there's a word on my tongue, behold, the Lord, you know it all. You have enclosed me behind and before you laid your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful. It's too high. I cannot attain to it. And we can't, can we? That God knows the next word is coming out of my mouth. My notes know that. God knows that. He knows your next thought. He knows if you're thinking about lunch or Olive Garden or whatever it is. He knows our next thought. We can't attain that, can we? Don't you wish sometimes you could read somebody's mind and you say, no, I don't want to do that. You see, God knows. The God who is all-knowing, has infinite awareness, understands and has complete insight and complete knowledge, searches me, searched David, searched you, searched your heart, and he knows us. Now the first thought should be, if God knows everything, why does he search me? That's relational, isn't it? He takes the time to look. That's relational. The word for search here is winnow. It's like a winnowing fork. It separates the wheat from the chaff. And so God separates our thoughts and the facts and the emotions and feelings and, and, and versus reality. Even though he already knows it. He makes it personal because each one of our thinking is a little bit different, isn't it? Each one of our personalities is a little bit different. Each one of our processes through life is different. We, we think differently, don't we? And we really find that out in marriage, don't we? We think differently. So God intently looks to our heart and he understands both the thought and intention behind his thoughts. It's an operation. God gets to the core of relationship. It's why God can say, I searched you and I know you. Now we see this in his word. Notice what it says in Hebrews 4, 12, and 13. This is the operation that his very word does. It says the word is living, active, sharper than any, any edged sword. It's not like reading a novel, novel when you read the Bible. Now, you can cry when you read a novel. But the word of God cuts down like a sharp sword in. And it's dissecting, it's working, it's operating on our heart and on our mind. So it's living. It pierces as far as division of soul and spirit. It's pretty far down, isn't it? That's why he sent the Holy Spirit to intercede, to interpret our spirit when we don't even have the words to talk to God. 
as far as joint and marrow, able to judge, notice, thoughts and intentions of the heart. That's why God, the Bible, encourages us to read, meditate on the Word. Because in those moments, you're having relationship with the mind of God. And He wants to be our Father and close. Listen, 13 is kind of scary. And there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are open and laid bare to the eyes of God in whom we will give an account. You see, this is a key element of good relationship connection. We're to search and know our children. Well, how do you do that? Well, just like leave it to Beaver. Mom goes and talks to Beaver. And we need to be able to search our spouse and our friends. Now, so how do we do that? We listen intentionally. We listen closely. God gave us two ears and one mouth. And we're supposed to listen as twice as much as we talk. And so he wants us to listen with intention to search, to understand our person. Also, we can ask, how do you feel? Now, when you ask your wife how you feel, you're getting a boatload because our wives feel a lot. Give them time to, 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 to tell you. You know, with Judy and I, with her, and I've gotten to know this, and uh, so I let it happen, and uh, we start out our conversation when I come home, and I give her a little time because she has to warm up and feel safe to open this. And maybe a lot of you ladies are like that, but you need those words to feel safe. And this idea of searching says that I care. It's the message. And when you're willing to search each other, it says somebody cares and it opens their heart. One day I really tried this out years ago. It was Gary Smalley. He's the one that suggested this. And uh, Judy and I went up in the club treehouse. I built a treehouse. She always went to treehouse. She was a kid. You know what? I'm going to fulfill that for my wife. And uh, I also found out her love language is service. If this would be a great service to Judy, she would know she feels love. I built her tree house. So I did that. So one day I'm up there, and I just let her talk. It was my plan. And talk and talk and talk. 45 minutes later, she punches me in the shoulder. She goes, I know what you're doing. I opened up. And so God wants that relational connection. You know, a good counselor, the first thing they do, a therapist, they get your history, don't they? they want to sum it all up. And so they search and they get a historical profile. Now look at verse 2. It says, "You." this is how God searches us. You know when I sit. You know when I rise up. So I thought about King David, the one who wrote this. And David sat in sackcloth and ashes for seven days as he waited the death of the illegitimate baby he had with Bathsheba. And during that time, I'm sure the whole story from front to finish was rehearsed in his mind. And he probably went back and said, why didn't I go to battle? Why did I walk out on that portico and let my eyes lust after Bathsheba? Why did I do that? And so for seven days he mourned for that child that it may live, that God may be gracious. God knew it was over. The baby passed. David got up and he washed and he ate. The baby would be gone, but he said, someday I'll be with the child in heaven. But he wasn't permitted to raise the child. It was over. It was time for David to go back and be the king. Now, we sit and rise a lot, don't we? You've been sitting here. Isn't it nice that this church has padded chairs, you know, both the back and the seat? And uh, aren't seats particular to you? You know, when you get an office chair or something like that, and, and when you go, you know, I'm like lazy boy, right? I mean... What are the different chairs you try to get, you know, and try to get that perfect one? Because we sit a lot, don't we? You know, we sit. And uh, we sit when we drive. And so I have to ask myself, what's my temperament when I drive? You know, I've had to work on that through the years. I, you know, I can be an angry driver. And, and I think it's because people don't care. See, they tell you, so they don't care. You know, you're going to kill me. You, you, could, you run into me and kill me. I have an accident, you know. You know, what's our temperament when we sit to drive? Some people have to drive a lot, don't you? Some people drive a long way for their jobs. And... Uh, so God is there. He knows when you sit. How about at work? What's on the computer? Work or something else? How about eating? How many times a day you sit to eat? Now, some people eat on a run. You know, they're just so busy that you don't run. I don't know how they do that, if they're running or not, but, but uh, I've seen people eat and stand, stand up and eat. 
you know, but most of the time we sit and we eat. How grateful are we? Is it every time? If it is, it's about three times a day. You be grateful to God. But he knows when you sit. Uh, when we sit and watch the idol, I mean the TV. What are we watching? How long? What's the content? He knows what we're watching. So there's a lot going on. God is mindful of all of it. He desires to be a part of our thoughts and actions when we sit down and when we rise up. What direction will we go? When we sit, we make plans. Is God in the plans? Do we rise up with him or do we rise up with me and where I'm going and what I want to do? It also says there that God understands. Raise your hand if you want to be understood. All right, interactive. Raise your hand. Because every one of us want to be understood, don't we? <laughs> I got a little hand over there. I bribed one of you. But we want to be understood, and God understands us completely. And so that's why we go to God when we have issues and problems first. Because he already understands uh, what we need. And with his understanding and with his wisdom, he guides us in the right direction, gives us the right answers. He disciplines us because he loves us and he's merciful and he cares and, and he loves us. You know, it's lowly not to be understood. You can be in a relationship for a very long time and all we can feel, I, I've never been understood. I hear ladies say that. It's a lonely place. But it's another key to healthy relationships. We have to take the time to understand each other no matter what it takes. Gary Smalley called it drive-through talking. You say something and you say it back to make sure we understand that we've communicated to each other. We need understanding. And so, uh, you know, Judy and I get to have words. You know what I mean? Words. We have words. You have words with your spouse? Yeah. But so often it ends up that we're saying the same thing differently. Because we don't always understand each other, do we? Now, working, I was working with a young man, uh, and I wanted to be his mentor and friend, and he wanted it, it was mutual and everything. And one day he said to me, you don't understand me. I said, he was right. I didn't understand him. So I started doing research, and I sat in, in, in small groups, and I tried to learn to understand him. It's a part of Christian attitude. It's part of Christian ministry that we take time to understand each other. That means we got to sacrifice some things, don't we? I said it earlier. Look at verse 3. It says, that You scrutinize my path, my lying down. You're into me acquainted with all my ways. And so God scrutinizes our laying down and our walking. And we walk to do a lot of things, don't we? Whether we walk around at work, walk around with the kids, whatever it is. But when God scrutinizes, it's, it simply means to examine, to inspect closely and thoroughly, to really take a look. Now, some people, our police officers, are trained in this. And so one time my father was taking me to, uh, we went to Towson for a trip. He had to meet somebody there and everything. He says, hey, while we're here, let's go see Sheriff Hickey. I said, Sheriff Hickey? You mean the Sheriff Hickey who has the Hickey School for Boys? Yeah, that's Sheriff. And uh, he was a real character. Remember Cannonball Run? I think it was that Sheriff. He, he was like him. So I walked in the office with my father. And he goes, hey, boy, how'd you cut off your finger? <laughs> right away, not many of you know that I have a cut off finger. Some of you know you know that. But that sheriff, he, he saw my finger right away. See, it's intent awareness of people. And that's how God is with us. He scrutinizes us. He, he surveils us. And so look, Big Brother's not the only one watching us. God is surveilling us, isn't he? But he does it to take care of us, our walk. He wants to know where we're walking, who we walk with. You see, life is a path, isn't it? The Bible says life's a path. Are you walking in God's direction or your own direction? Where are you walking? And we can walk into places that we have no business walking in, or we could choose a path that we should have never. We, we didn't check with God first. We didn't allow his word to affect us. And uh, a long time ago uh, in college, uh, I had a really f tough first year. I had, um, uh, what do they call it? Um, I had jaundice, and my liver was inflamed. And that is painful, and you don't know what it is. You think you're going to die. Uh, your eyes turn yellow, and your urine gets real dark, and crazy things like that. And uh, it's scary, kind of a scary thing. And uh, 
And so I adopted this verse right here. You, you're probably familiar with it too. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. It says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge him, and he will make straight your path. So God knows our path. He knows where we walk. And whether you're young now and looking for a career, or you're looking for a spouse, God said, trust me. I know her already. I know him already for you. But you have to trust in God's understanding and wait on him and not in your own hormones. But you have to trust in him. So many people come out of the world of addiction nowadays. The best advice is Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 that you could give them to trust in the Lord. Now notice notice verse 3. He knows our lying down. Now, I don't know what it's like for you when you lay down, but sometimes my mind is going a mile a minute, and sometimes it's relaxed. Now, Judy says, she, you know, she envies me because I fall right to sleep, but her mind just keeps going. So we lay our heads down. Sometimes we survey the whole day. Think about that. Sometimes we're anxious about tomorrow. And Jesus said, don't worry about tomorrow. It has enough anxiety itself. You're not going to do anything now when you lay your head on a pillow to go to sleep. You're just not going to rest. So he knows our laying down, our thoughts from afar. And in that laying down moment, let's not miss it. He's there. The best way to end your day is talk to him. He knows you're lying down no matter where it is. So thank you. It's a perfect time to do it. You know, a lot of times we worry before we go to bed. He wants, to st- he wants to take that worry, doesn't he? Now look at verse 5. Really interesting verse. Because here, God surveils. God knows your anxious thoughts. He knows your thoughts. He knows when you rise up, sit down. He knows our thoughts. He knows what's going on in our whole person. Now that's hard in our normal relationships here, isn't it? We only reveal what we want to. But God already sees what's happening. And here's what he does with it. He says, you have enclosed me behind and before, and you lay your hand upon me. Now, with absolute searching knowledge of us, God hems us in. He wants sometimes to change our course, and sometimes he wants to stay right where we are, to stay on course. Remember, Paul said that God doesn't let us be tempted with any more than this which is common to man, He doesn't want you to fall. He wants you to learn from that temptation. And also, he leaves a way of escape. And this verse 5 directs us in that way. You see, God, we veer off, don't we? And his intention with his hand before and behind us is to bring us back to him. So very early in my Christianity, I had things I had to get rid of right away, Charlie. And so the smoking and the cussing went pretty, pretty good. Getting rid of the addiction of marijuana was difficult. It took me some time. After I was baptized, I would say six weeks later, I went out and, uh, and smoked some reefer. And I tell you, a, a heaviness and a guilt fell upon me that finished that addiction. Because then, with that heaviness, I said, time, it's over. Done. And that's when God takes over. Having been high, having touched alcohol, I was 20-some years old, Uh, I'm 64 now, so you do the math. And God will take it away when you're ready to surrender it. But early in my life, he wanted to get something straightened out right away from the very beginning. And sometimes God wants to stop behavior that distances us from him, that separates us from God. So he said basically to me, no, absolutely no fornication. I lived my life the way I wanted to. Musician, my father had a nightclub, did whatever I wanted. But now he's saying, we're getting this straightened out. So by my own free will, I got myself involved in a personal relationship with somebody that was very dangerous. And of course, I didn't know it at the time. But God used it to scare me straight. And I decided to be celibate until I got married. That was 40 years. Now, I'm not patting myself on the back. I'm saying you can't have a relationship with the holy God when you're fornicating. 
And he wanted a relationship with me from that very early time. It changed the whole course of my life. And God did that. He hemmed me in and said, make a decision. So it happened. With all the knowledge and power that God has, his omniscience, he chooses every day to search our human heart. It's up to us if we want to give that back, if we want a closer walk with him. So King David got it right. God promised that his heir would be on the throne forever. We know that was Jesus. And so with that thought in mind, I'm going to go into the communion time. If you haven't uh, picked up a communion, they're right in the back in a basket right there if you need to get one. And so Jesus becomes our Savior, lays down his life for his friends. How close of a friend do you need? So therefore we remember him. And so when we take the bread, it reminds us he came in the flesh, wanted to be that near, that close to his people, to you personally. So he gave his body. Now he doesn't ask us to give our body back on the cross, but he asks us to surrender our personal life to him so he can use us to love somebody else. So Jesus broke his body. It was broken the moment he came into conception because he was God. Then that covenant we talked about earlier that God wanted with Israel and with all people. He shed his blood for that new covenant, the everlasting covenant. Take it personal, because it is. Because right now, that blood was shed for each one of us. Father, we thank you for Jesus. Thank you for the cross. Because it called us back to God, our Father, who searches us, knows us, loves us. So, Father, as we remember the price that Jesus paid for that closer walk, we praise you and thank you and ask your blessing upon these emblems. It's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen.